So now I'm going to talk about the stage of interrogation with Jesus, not with John. They determined that John's movement was not significant as far as him being the Messiah. But with Jesus, it was significant. So I'm going to go through the stage of interrogation with Jesus. And actually, the stage of, stage of interrogation with Jesus lasts, lasts the rest of the Gospels. I mean, once they start in, they never stop. So verse 15, 1, when, Matthew 15, 1, when some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses their father and their mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and their mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father and their mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. So, what was the problem in the rest of the Gospels? It was the oral law. It was the problem was the oral law. So, the stage of interrogation basically is the Pharisees and the Sadducees questioning Jesus on why he doesn't follow the oral law. Now here, it's like they're walking through a wheat field. It's on the Sabbath. They're hungry. His, his disciples are hungry. They take some of the wheat in their hand. They rub it together. They blow off the chaff and eat the wheat. Now, that broke about 18 rules <laughs> of the oral law. Okay? working, they're, they're, they're threshing, they're blowing is working, you know, all this stuff. And they said, they, and so they're saying, why do your disciples uh, break the tradition of the elders? The tradition of the elders means the oral law. And Jesus, in, in Mark, calls them the, just the traditions of men. Because that's who made it up. He says, it's just man-made has nothing to do with me but they didn't believe that so all 100% of the conflict in the Gospels between Jesus and the Pharisees is over the oral law if, if something came up with the written law with the 613 the Torah commandments there were, there were 365 negative commandments don't do this and there were 248 positive commandments. Do this, totaling 613. Jesus kept them perfectly. He was the only person that ever lived that kept those 613 perfectly. So there was never any conflict over the written law because they couldn't say anything to him because he was keeping it perfectly. All, 100% of the conflict was over the oral law. And that is the interrogation. They interrogate him. They question him. Why aren't you doing this? Why do you do this? Why don't you do this? All over the all over the uh, the oral law. So the irony was that on the one hand, it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees who made up these three messianic miracles. Jesus didn't make them up. They were understood as a common understanding in Judaism for 400 years before Jesus was even born that those three messianic miracles Isaiah lived 700 years before Christ so Jesus didn't make him up but it's, it's almost like he said well you know if that's what you guys believe I'll do these things to show you I'm the Messiah so he did heal a uh, Jewish leper. He did cast out a mute demon. He did heal a man that was born blind. And they still didn't believe. Him. Even though he even though he uh, performed the three messianic miracles that they themselves believed in. So on the one hand Jesus was doing the three messianic miracles. But on the other hand he did not believe in the oral law. And they had and the, San, the pressure is on the Sanhedrin. They have to come up with a decision. And you know, on the one hand, people could say, well, look, he's doing all the things that we said the Messiah would do. 
Uh, and then on the other hand, people say, yeah, but he doesn't believe in the oral law. So we're going to go through that in the next in the next three weeks. We're going to go through next week. We will talk about the healing of a Jewish leper and why that was so significant. Okay, I'm going to talk now about Hebrew words. Some Hebrew words that um, if you had a, um, what's called a, a complete Jewish Bible, um, CWCJV, Complete Jewish Bible, by David Stern, um, these words will be in there. If you have a, a Tree of Life, um, TVL, Tree of Life version, um, TLV, Tree of, Tree of TLV, Tree of Life version. Um, these words will be in there. Um, if you go to a Messianic congregation, if we, if, if you happen to go down to Kol Dodi with us, um, between the seventh and eighth meeting on a Saturday, you might hear some of these words. Okay, Tanakh. The Hebrew Bible is divided up into three sections. Torah, the prophets, and the writings. The last book in the Old Testament in the Gentile Bible is Malachi. The last book in the Hebrew, the way the Hebrew Bible uh, organizes, is Second Chronicles. So they're, they're organized a little differently because it's the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. So the TA stands for Torah. The NA, this is a like a like an like a acronym. The NA stands for the uh, Netavim, which stands for the prophets, and the KH stands for the Ketavim, which stands for the, the writings. So that's why I have it uh, capitalized. Capital lowercase, capital lowercase, capital lowercase because it's the three, Torah, Prophets, Writings, and it's pronounced Tanakh. So Messianic believers do not say Old Testament. They say, well, it's in the Tanakh. The second is The name of God. God only has one name, and He has many attributes. And many times people um, call His attributes His name. This is this is the name of God, and the Jews were so reverent with God's name that when they were writing manuscripts. They would take a pen and they would they would start and they would just write one one stroke of the first letter and throw the pen away and they would get another pen and they would dip in the ink and write the next stroke of the name of God and throw that away they were just the uh, and and they were so reverent to the name of God that they did not pronounce the name of God they said the name you know the name and so what happened over centuries because they didn't you know if you don't use it you lose it and they lost how to pronounce the name of God so today Jews nobody knows the original way to pronounce the name of God however there was a, uh, a Spanish Jesuit monk in Spain during the Dark Ages that thought he would help God out. You know how it goes when we help God out. <laughs> like he needs our help. <clears throat> and so he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add some letters there. I'm going to add some, some things to help God out. And so this is 15th century, 15th century. So this is where we get the made up name Jehovah. 
Yahovah. You never hear the name Jehovah in a Messianic congregation among Jews. It is an insult to them. They, they take offense at that. They may not be in your face about it, but they don't like it. So what the Jews have done is they've come up with two other names here, Adonai and Hashem. And they use those kind of interchangeably for God's name. Now, Adonai comes from the root of uh, righteousness. And the ha, anytime you see a ha, like ha here, ha matzah, the bread. Feast of the bread. Ha, the, shem means name, the name. So they use Hashem and they use Adonai. And Adonai is more like daddy. Abba, father, you know. Let me crawl up on your lap and hug your neck and call you Adonai. Hashem is kind of like, yes, sir. You know, being called on the carpet. Yes, sir. But both are appropriate. I mean, Jews use those interchangeably. They do not use Jehovah. And then um, the righteous of the Tanakh. Christians use the word saints. Well, the Jews use the righteous of the Tanakh, the righteous of the Old Testament, the righteous of the Tanakh, to refer to uh, a Jewish, you know, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, are not only the patriarchs, they're the righteous of the Tanakh. A Jew, a, a, a Messianic Jew that has died and passed on you know, they refer to that person as one of the one of the righteous of the Tanakh. They use um, sometimes they use a Yohanan uh, instead of John, or um, you know, Metiyahu um, instead of Matthew, stuff like that. But there's just you, you. You might hear some names if you go to the if you go to Koldovi, You might hear some of these names. Um, they do a Torah procession where they have a like a they take out the Torah and they put it on their shoulder and they they march around. And uh, you're just not supposed to turn your back to Torah. You're supposed to as it goes around the room. You're supposed to face it, face it, face it, face it, face it. But lastly, just Torah. This will be kind of a theme um, <clears throat> during the whole class here, the rest of the weeks, of how you view Torah. In many churches, they, they talk about the law, you know, kind of in harsh terms. And it's unfortunate because God, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the Torah, but to fulfill it. So the Torah has not been done away with. Now, we don't have to follow the 613 for salvation, like the Jews had to do in the, in the dispensation of uh, Torah, in the dispensation of grace, it's by faith. But it doesn't mean that Torah is not valuable today. I kind of view it as a, as a blueprint for living. You know, if we look at the things that Torah says to us um, and try our best to follow it, then our lives will go better doesn't mean we're going to be saved by it. Our lives are going to go better. Some people uh, talk about 
like uh, kosher. They want to eat kosher, follow the dietary laws. We have freedom in Christ to do that or not to do that. You know, some people, I know some people that that do and some people that don't. But no, I mean, in, in Kodori, there are people that do and people that don't. And the people that don't, nobody's, nobody's in their face about it. Okay? But if we read from Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners' sake or sit in the company of mockers. But those whose delight is in Torah of the Lord, who meditates on his Torah day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not weather, whatever they do prospers. That's a wonderful thing. Now, in the NIV here, it doesn't say Torah. It says the law. And to me, you know, the law is kind of a harsh, don't break the law, you know, kind of a harsh thing. So in the complete Jewish Bible or in the Tree of Life version, it doesn't say the law, it says Torah. Those who delight in, 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 in the Torah, the Torah of the Lord, who meditates, on his, who meditates on his Torah day and night, is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not weather, whatever they do prospers. So the bad part of the law is the oral law. That's bad. The oral law is bad. That's why you know, it's not the oral Torah because it has nothing to do with Torah. It's the oral law. Unfortunately, many churches today throw the baby out with the bathwater and because they equate the six hundred, you know, the, 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 the five books, the, the commandments, positive and negative, and the five books of Moses with the oral law, and they're not the same thing. They're different. So all the Jews did was when they could not follow the 613 commandments of Moses, they took God's high holy standard and they pulled it down in the gutter to things they could do. They could not, if they were a tailor, they could not carry their, their needle 25 steps or more on, on the Sabbath. They could do that. But the, but the 613, they could not do. So constantly during, during this, this class, we need to make a differentiation between the righteous, the Torah is righteous and good. In the book of Acts, in chapter 21, 20, about 28 to 30 years after Pentecost, 28 to 30 years after Pentecost, Paul arrives from his third messianic, his third missionary journey. And I'll just read uh, a couple of verses here, starting 2117. When they arrived in Jerusalem, when Paul and his group arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. Luke is talking here because Luke was uh, traveling with Paul. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, who was the brother, half-brother of Jesus and leader of the church of Jerusalem. And all the elders were present of the church of Jerusalem. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. When the Jews in Jerusalem heard what God had done through Paul's work to the Gentiles, they praised God. And they said to Paul, and they said to Paul, you see, brother, 
how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the Torah. So about 30 years after Shavuot, after Pentecost, after weeks, those that 50 days after um, Rashid, there were that word, um, how many thousands, in some translations it says myriads, in other translations it says tens of thousands. So there were at least, minimum 20,000 Jews who were zealous for the Torah 30 years after Pentecost. So if people talk about wanting to be uh, a New Testament church, the, uh, the, you know, a church like in the book of Acts, so if they're serious about that, then they should all be zealous for the Torah. Because that's what Paul report, reported um, in Acts. The reason that in a, in a Messianic um, worship service, they have the uh, Torah procession and take the time to do that is that they honor these are believers now. Some Jewish, mostly Gentile. They, they, they so much honor Torah. And unfortunately, they, in many churches, it's uh, discarded as something old and not useful anymore. 